Hello and welcome to the Rizina Fireside Chat. And today we have a special guest joining is Anne Neuberger, who is a U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies. So our discussion is going to take place in a very uh, in the backdrop of a very important development, which is the the purchase of Twitter by billionaire Elon Musk for $44 billion. And this is when the big tech is itself coming under increasing scrutiny for its failure to tackle misinformation as well as hate speech. And also there are calls for the regulation of the big tech uh, platforms. So uh, also the, the tech is being weaponized by the authoritarian regimes against the democracies. So how should democracies tackle the challenges of technology as well as what is the future of technology and cyberspace? Uh, at a time of the heightened global uh, polarization, and how can democracies collaborate to develop the technologies? So uh, I'm going to start with uh, DNS and Newberger. And ma'am, uh, let me start by asking you, looking at the current tech scenario, uh, which emerging technologies, in your view, will be the significant for the democracies? Thank you so much for the question, and it's really great to be here at the Racina Dialogue and to have this conversation in Delhi, given India's active tech sector and the degree of expertise and just advancements that come out of India today. Mm -hmm. So to your question first, as you said, technology both has brought us tremendous advancements, right? Just the way we can bring together data now to, for example, find a rare anomaly in a cancer and bring together just a small number of cases um, and find drugs in a positive way. On the other side, as you noted, it can be a force for disinformation, focused disinformation. So when we look at particular technologies that we see shaping in the near future, and I'm going to talk near future in the next zero to, to really three years, one is certainly the rollout of 5G. Certainly we see that here in India. The reason 5G is so interesting is not only because of the degree of data delivery at the endpoints it offers with the power of that data in so many different businesses, so many different sectors, but also with regard to new approaches that we can do from a 5G perspective, software-based approaches, virtualized approaches, which can really bring down the cost of telecom modernization. And the degree to which, for example, in India, with the size of the market here and the Made in India approach, that can provide so much benefit around the world. That's one area. A second key area, of course, is related to that, the role of really AI and machine learning. It's one of the promises of 5G, learning from data to come to conclusions we can't otherwise come to in the fields of medicine, agriculture, rapidly identifying diseases and crops and fixing those quickly. Certainly from the area of quantum, we're having discussions about the rollout of post-quantum cryptography and how we work on that together, as well as areas related to autonomous technologies, which we're very excited about. Thank you. Uh, now, looking at these uh, technological developments, uh, when we look at some of the democracies, particularly the smaller uh, democracies, they do not have the capacity to uh, tackle these uh, emerging uh, technologies. How can we empower them to you know, uh, harness the potential of these technologies? It's such a wonderful question because we want a, we want all countries to be able to benefit from the promise of technology, right? Whether, for example, it's digital currencies and bringing down the cost of remittances, um, bringing down and providing access to the unbanked, those are great examples. So I think first is, as we look at our digital development efforts around the world, joining arms as countries with strong technology bases so we can bring down the cost of technology. And then second, investing in people, because at the end of the day, it is all about people. And one of the positive parts of all the information that's moved online during the pandemic is how much education, learning, and certification, so that people can show their skills without a college degree, and how we spread that knowledge to allow more countries and really to bridge the digital divide. So not only more countries, but more people within countries can gain the skills to be a part of digital economies. Thank you. Uh, you think there is a space and scope for the tech-based partnerships, such as what the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson talked about, D10, and what uh, the other concept about the techno-democracies coming together. You think there's a space and scope for these kind of partnerships to uh, join hands together and do something uh, on this? We absolutely believe in that. As you know, President Biden hosted the Summit for Democracy, and many of the 100 countries who participated are actually here at Racina. And the goal of the Summit for Democracies was to bring together democracies to say, how do we ensure we deliver for our people? And how do we ensure we can specifically do so in the realm of using technology as a force for good? Because as you said earlier, technologies, technology can facilitate authoritarianism, really 
forcing and controlling discourse in a, in a society, or it can facilitate free exchange of information. And we want to ensure we're working together to promote the positive aspects as a group of democracies really delivering for our people. And some of the areas that came out of that, as you know, the U.S. had, you know, we're putting in over $400 million in five different areas of free press, technology that protects democracy. So for example, privacy protecting tech, there's a lot of exciting information there that could potentially help us gain the benefits of AI while managing the privacy risks. Areas related to um, secure communications, to fighting disinformation. So we really believe in that and we see the follow on work coming out of the Summit for Democracies as a way to do it. I think you know we have the international challenge grants to bring in the best minds around the world on some of these challenges as well. Great. Now, tackling the, the most burning question here about the Ukraine crisis and the Russian invasion, uh, how do you look at the effectiveness of the, the American and the Western uh, sanctions uh, targeting the Russian uh, tech sector? The first part, we believe that sanctions will, are already having an impact, and particularly the tech sector will significantly grow an impact in terms of shaping the ability for Russia to replenish its military, frankly, to continue to advance the technology of its military, because so many of the technologies it requires, it requires to import. And by controlling that ability to bring in software, to bring in hardware, to bring in microelectronics, we believe we can significantly impact the advancement of Russian military, as well as the replacement of the significant degree of military capability it is using and losing on the battlefield in Ukraine. I would also note that, you know, response to Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, seeing the way countries came together to enforce those tech sanctions has really been proof that we as a community of countries can point to behaviors, can point to a, ma a massive invasion like this and say, we will use everything we can from economic sanctions, to tech sanctions to ensure that there's a cost to countries that invade, that break the rules-based order that we rely on, particularly that smaller countries rely on um, to defend themselves. And what kind of retaliation do you expect from the Russian side uh, uh, for, for the sanctions? So I won't get into hypotheticals. Um, we certainly are watching for greater and greater impact. And we certainly um, are prepared for among each country and together to ensure that we can continue to implement what's needed to cause Russia to pause the invasion, to return to active negotiations and pull out of Ukraine and help Ukraine restore the sovereignty of its borders. But with this kind of polarization at the international level, do you also see a kind of a, uh, the, the, the division of the Internet on political lines uh, overall? We firmly believe in a secure, open, and interoperable internet. We certainly have seen Russia, in the context of the invasion of Ukraine, begin to put in place its sovereign borders in the internet, controlling discourse, controlling um, the ability of its population to get access to information, and working to really start to take steps to um, really disconnect that secure, open, interoperable approach. We firmly believe that in a world of different ideas and diverse opinions, it is the best way to bring together individuals to discuss and debate ideas and very much um, have concerns about authoritarian governments work to propose or, or put in place sovereign approaches to the internet, whether that's in standards bodies as we've seen, um, for example, at the ITU, certain countries work to put in place, or whether it's in the context of a particular conflict and controlling the conversation. So it's something where we see certain countries pursuing that path, and we very much believe as a community of democracies, we must work together to maintain a secure, interoperable, and open internet to allow the global commerce and global exchange of ideas. Thank you. So uh, recently, the United States passed the COMPETES Act, which provides additional funding uh, for scientific, scientific research. Uh, how do you think it positions US vis-a-vis -vis other countries, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China, in terms of taking the lead on some of these emerging tech technologies? Such an interesting question. So first, for the status of the COMPETES Act, a version of it passed in both our House and our Senate, and it's currently um, being refined between the two and being finalized. 
So for the U.S., it highlights the way President Biden puts a focus on research and development and noting that in complex technology areas, government R&D can jumpstart a number of economic areas, a number of national security areas, and can jumpstart private sector investment as well. So we are very excited from a U.S. perspective in the role this R&D investment will make in some really key technologies, and also look very much to work in partnership with some of our closest allies and partners, many of which are here. India, of course, is a key one to really partner on R&D efforts, to advance what we're doing from a tech transfer perspective so we can all gain the benefits of these emerging technologies in a host of fields, in various sectors related to our economies. We talked about a few, um, as well as in some of our national security partnerships. You know, so for example, I talked earlier about the benefits of you know, artificial intelligence in the medical field and in the agricultural field. Cultural field.